Hi, and welcome to the Classroom Management Solutions online training event for teachers. We are so excited to have you here. Today we're going to be talking about a five-step plan to help you regain control of your classroom starting tomorrow. And I can't I can't wait to get into all of this with you. It's going to be so great to just go through this plan and then we're going to take questions at the end and we're so excited to have you here. Right now, everyone is just joining us. So if you are here, you can do us a huge favor and introduce yourself in the chat box. That'll help us let you know, us know that you're here and we can't wait to meet everybody. You can also do a huge favor, and if you can hear me right now, go ahead and type in the box, I can hear you, and that's super helpful so that I know everything's working correctly, and that we'll be ready to go here in just a couple minutes. Awesome, looks like people can hear us. As you're joining in, hop on and introduce yourself. We'd love to hear what you teach, where you're from, how long you've been teaching. Great, so glad everyone can hear, that's awesome. I'm excited about today's event. We've done this training before and I've gotten such great feedback. Um, so many teachers have said that it's been helpful and I'm, my prayer is that it will be helpful for you here today. We're gonna talk about a simple five-step plan to regain control of your classroom starting tomorrow. And we're gonna try to make it super practical, give you real, tangible things that you can do starting tomorrow to start regaining control of your classroom. Awesome. So glad to see everybody. We've got people from Texas, Michigan, Tennessee. Oh, welcome. Glad to have an assistant principal with us. Uh, first year teacher in North Carolina. Welcome. Awesome. So glad to see everybody. It's exciting. And as I said, if you haven't done so yet, we'd love to hear how long you've been teaching and what ages and subjects you teach. We normally have such a great variety. It's so exciting. Let's see, we've got kindergarten, music, all kinds of different uh, varieties here. And this training is designed for K through 12. So we're going to take general principles. We're going to apply them to a wide variety of age ranges. So that don't let that concern you that we've got high school, elementary, that's no problem. These principles work pretty much across the board. And then, like I say, we'll apply them both to younger and to older students. All right. Just got about one more minute. Going to give people just another minute or two, as I know we have more people joining us here, let's give everyone just one more minute to join in. For those of you just joining us, we're introducing each each introducing ourselves at this point. Love to hear how long you've been teaching, what ages and subjects that you teach. Uh, feel free to share any other information you'd like as well. Uh, you can share where you're teaching or any other piece of info that's super helpful. Welcome everyone, so exciting to see everyone here. All right, I know we'll have more people joining us here in the next few minutes, but we are going to go ahead and get started because I know you're busy and we do not wanna waste anyone's time. So we're gonna go ahead and jump into it. And I think we've established everyone can hear me. Um, if there are those in the chat box that are saying they can't hear, typically that's a problem with their computers. If you wanna encourage them to check their own sound settings and make sure things are right on their end or sometimes even restarting it can help too. All right, we're gonna get started. This is Classroom Management Solutions. And I wanna start by asking you a few questions. Have you ever felt like your classroom is just a little bit out of control. Have you ever felt like no one is listening to you? Have you ever felt like you just don't know what to do? You know something has to change, but you're just not sure what to change or how to do it. So have I. 
My first year was really rough. And I want you to know that if you're having a tough time, you are not alone. Just look at the chat box and see how many other people are struggling with this. And like I said, I had a really rough first year too. It was funny because I knew I knew a lot of good techniques. I, I'd learned a lot. I'd you know, been with other teachers. I'd watched other teachers. I'd picked up a lot of good strategies, but I was missing a few key elements. And it's crazy how just one or two missing elements can really throw a wrench into everything. Um, so I'm going to share with you a little bit of my story and I'm going to share with you what I did to turn it around. And I'm so thankful God put teachers and resources in my life that helped me do that. And I can't wait to share it with you tonight. So we're going to be talking about a five-step plan to regain control of your classroom and of course get you and your students smiling again. Because I'm sure you've realized if you're struggling with classroom management, you're not happy, your students aren't happy, your students aren't learning, right? It's it's just kind of a mess all the way around. And so we're gonna work, look at how we can regain control and get back on track. All right, just in case, I know some of you have been around Teach for the Heart for a while, some of you are brand new, and I'd actually be super curious to see how many of you are familiar with Teach for the Heart and how many of you, this is your first time with us. But in case you don't know me, my name is Linda Cardamus, and as I said, I am the founder of Teach for the Heart. I taught middle school math in a Christian school in Ohio before stepping away to uh, when I when I got pregnant, I stepped away to raise my family. And it's been such a blessing to see how God, I was really a little bit sad about stepping away, even though I was excited to stay home with my son. But I was a little bit sad about that. But I was so thankful how God gave me education back in the, and gave me the privilege of being able to share and talk with all of you. And it's so exciting. Oh, it's awesome. We have a lot of first time people here and some people that have been around Teach for the Heart for a while as well. It's awesome. So glad to have you all. So anyhow, I am the creative Teach for the Heart. I'm also the author of Create Your Dream Classroom and the creator of Teach Uplifted. And of course, Classroom Management 101, which we'll share a little bit more about later. All right, before we dive in, I'm just gonna pause a moment, if you don't mind. Um, I'm gonna pause and open up in prayer um, just that I'll be able to give you a helpful presentation tonight. Dear Father, thank you so much for the technology that allows us to <laughs> be here from all over the country and even all over the world. I pray that you will guide my words, make this presentation helpful to the teachers, help them come away with something tangible that they can do tomorrow, and just encourage them. Those that are discouraged, please encourage them, help them know that you're with them, and help them to depend on you um, for the help that they need in their classroom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're about to get started. If you you might want to grab notes, uh, take some notes. So if you want to run and grab a pen and a sheet of paper, feel free to run and grab that real quick. And we're just about ready to get started. All right, here we go. We're going to dive right in to step number one. All right, if your class is out of control, or even if it's just maybe it's not out of control, but it's just uh, not quite where you want it to be. First thing you need to do is make sure that you as the teacher have the right demeanor. Uh, here's what I mean about that. You don't want to try to be your student's friend. This is a trap that's really easy to fall into uh, because we want our students to like us, right? We want to get along with them and we want to have a good rapport. So sometimes we fall into the trap of trying to be their friend. But I want to encourage you to make just a slight mindset shift. And instead of looking at yourself as their friend, look at, as your, look at yourself as their mentor. Now, a mentor is still very intimately involved in their life, right? They care. There's someone they go to for advice. They, there's, there's a deep rapport and an important relationship. But it's different than a friend, right? So a friend isn't going to necessarily hold you accountable, isn't going to raise you up to another level, isn't going to expect these incredible things from you. They might, but they might not, right? A friend is on your level. A mentor is pulling someone up, expecting more of them. And so that's one helpful thing. A mentor will do the hard thing, even though the person might not like it, right? A friend often is just going to go along with whatever, but a mentor is going to do the hard thing. Um, and even if they know maybe the mentee or the student won't like it in the short term, but they know it's better for them in the long term, they'll do it. So that's the first thing. Just shift your thoughts. Instead of thinking of yourself as their friend, strive to be a good mentor. 
Here's another don't and do. Don't worry about being liked. All right. We all, let's, let's be honest, right? Every one of us would say we want our students to like us. Of course we do. No one wants to be disliked. That's silly. But notice I said don't worry about being liked. Don't focus on that. If you focus on, do my students like me, you're going to make classroom management mistakes. You're not going to deal with things you should deal with. And you're going to say things you shouldn't say. And it's just not going to go well. So instead of worrying about being liked, focus on being respected and on earning that respect from your students. So just once again, just a little mindset shift. If, if Every time you're tempted to say, oh, I want to be liked, think, no, I want to be respected. And the ironic thing here is that if you try to get your students to like you, a lot of times that doesn't go very well. You don't get their respect. And in the end, if your classroom is out of control, your students don't end up liking you. They end up disliking your class for the most part. However, if you focus on being respected, often, not every time, but often, a lot of those students will actually end up really liking you in your class. So, and especially when they look back on it in years to come. So instead of focusing on being liked, focus on being respected. So the goal is to be both kind and firm. How many of you, I don't know about, I don't know how many of you have fallen into the trap of thinking I either have to be kind or I have to be strict. Like I, if I'm the nice teacher, I can't be strict. Or if I'm the strict teacher, I can't be nice. Sometimes we have that in our mind, this dichotomy that I'm one or the other. You know, I'm, I'm the nice teacher. I see those strict teachers. I don't want to be like them. Or I'm the strict teacher. I'm not like those pushover nice teachers. You have to be both. You got to get rid of that dichotomy of thinking. You must be both kind and firm in order to have a strong classroom. So what that means is you should be nice. You should be personable. It should be it sh you. Sh your students should get to know you. You should be understanding to students when they're going through hard times or having struggles. You should even be fun to be around. Students should enjoy your class and enjoy and see your passion for your subject. But at the same exact time, even though you're nice and personable and fun, you have high expectations for your students. When issues come up, you deal with them. You don't let them slide. And you're not a pushover. You deal with the problems as they come up. And so when you're both kind and firm, you have that right demeanor and you're on track. That's the first step in having strong classroom management. So before we go on to number two, let's pause a moment and make it personal. I want you to type into the chat box, what do you need to change about your demeanor? Is there a tweak that you need to make? Is there something that you, a little mindset shift that you need to have or a different way that you need to start acting uh, starting tomorrow? What do you need to change about your demeanor? All right, so that's step number one, is to find the right demeanor. Step, um, before we go on, actually, there's one other question here. Um, so we asked before, what do you need to change about your demeanor? To take it one step further, what's one specific way you can start changing this tomorrow? So in other words, if you say, I need to not be a pushover, what does that mean? What does that look like? So this might be a good question to write down and really think this through tonight after we get off. What is that going to look like? Oh, so exciting to see all these answers. Want to be more of a mentor, be firm, be kinder when eliminating disruption. Um, consistency, yes, consistency is very important. We're gonna talk about that here soon. All right, so let's move on to step number two. Step number two, you need systems to get attention and eliminate distractions. The truth is you need a system for everything in your class, but we don't have time to talk about everything in this one hour session. So we're gonna focus right now on what system do you use to get attention and what system do you use to eliminate all the distractions in your classroom? First of all, my recommendation for getting attention, if you don't use class response or call and response sayings, I highly recommend them. I think these have become very popular, but I'd still run into teachers that aren't familiar with them. So I don't know about you, but I, when I was teaching, these were not popular. And so I spent so much, I, I tried everything to get my students' attention. I tried the stand and wait. 
and you know, just waiting and waiting and waiting. I tried, you know, I, I always thought it was ridiculous when students, when teachers turn off the lights, you know, flick the lights, but I thought, you know, Hey, I could teach my students to flick the lights because, you know, they got to see something. And so I tried that. That didn't work very well. You know, I, I tried so many different things and I never came up with something I really loved until I ran across call and response sayings. And these are ingenious. Basically, what happens is that you teach your students and you have to practice this. We'll talk about that later. But you teach your students that when you say something, they respond. So the first one here is class. Yes. So you as a teacher go class and the class responds. Yes. Or another one, you might say all set and the class responds. You bet. The beauty of these call and response sayings is that they have to say something. So the problem with the stand and wait or the flick the lights or the raise your hand is that the students, it's like there's not doing anything in response. It's passive. They're just supposed to stop talking. And in theory, they would just stop talking. But it's hard to cut off those conversations. But when you say all set, and the students have to respond, you bet, it cuts off their conversation and that immediately refocuses them. Now you have to practice this. We'll get to that soon. This isn't just a magic pill if you don't practice it, but they can be incredibly effective. And these can work all the way up and down the grade spectrum, right? You can use kind of fun, silly ones in you know the younger grades. In the higher grades, you know, pick something from a movie or something that's germane to your school culture. Pick something that they'd enjoy, uh, but you can find an age appropriate class and response saying, or just the standard class yes works, of course, too. All right. So what about, so that's about getting attention. That's one tip for you. How about eliminating distractions? Okay. There's a couple, there's so many different ways that you can eliminate distractions. And if you have a system that's working for you, awesome. But if you don't, I'm going to suggest two different options that you could consider for use in your classroom. The first one is whole brain teaching. And I'm not sure, whole brain teaching is an entire system of running your classroom. And you can use all of their ideas or you can just pick out a few of those ideas. It's really up to you. But I'm going to share one of the things that they do. In whole brain teaching, they recommend using call and response to eliminate distractions. So in other words, let's say that one of the rules in your classroom is raise your hand for permission to speak. And that's one of the rules that whole brain teaching recommends. So let's say that's rule two, raise your hand for permission to speak. So what you do is, and you teach your classes, you practice it, as I said, and we're gonna get into that. But when let's say George is talking out of turn, you say, hey George, remember, rule two. And you've taught your class that when you say rule two, the entire class says out loud, raise your hand for permission to speak. So once again, what you've done is you've drawn attention, you, you've corrected, you've reinforced what should happen, and there probably, unless unless the problem persists, there's not, no need for this big, you know, discipline action or anything like that. Um, but you are going to, um, you are going. Sorry, I just saw the one that said. <laughs> I say, excuse me, class, and they say cricket, cricket, cricket. Okay, these are some great call and response things. Anyhow, though, I'm losing, I'm getting distracted. So in call and response, you say rule two, the whole class responds, raise your hand for permission to speak. And the beauty is that you've corrected it quickly and you can move right on. And the point is that the whole class is reminded of what the expectation is. So as I said, you'd, a whole class would respond, raise your hand for permission to speak. Whole brain teaching has so many other great ideas. If you've never heard of them, I'd encourage you just to Google it. Or we have an article on the website that, um, that introduces a lot of the ideas. And maybe I can share that link here at the end. So that's one option for how you could eliminate distractions. Another option is to use a warning system. So... There's a couple different ways you can set up a warning system. You could use a behavior chart, uh, which is kind of more common in elementary. You could use Class Dojo. If you're not familiar with Class Dojo, it's an online system where you can easily keep track of good and negative behavior, and you can award positive and negative points, and you can do it all within the app. It's pretty cool. If you haven't seen it before, you might want to check it out. Another simple way to give a warning is to write names on the board if you're comfortable doing that, or honestly, anything you'd like. You can give a warning any way you want. You can put post-it notes on kids' desks. You can put a check mark on a chart, and you can do whatever you want. So you're probably thinking, okay, what exactly is a warning? Um, what do you mean by that? So here's how a warning system works. 
if a student is talking or being disruptive or whatever the problem is, what you do, you do not stop teaching. That's the beauty of the warning system. Don't interrupt your teaching, okay? Just keep going with your lesson, but you go and you give them a warning in whatever way you've decided. You move their clip on the chart. You write their name on the board. Um, you you put a sticky note on their desk. And by the way, I use this for middle school and even, uh, even some high schoolers. So uh, when I did this, I wrote names on the board and I t explained to them, you know, I, this, I know this feels elementary. It's the point is not to make you feel like an elementary student. The point is I need to give you, I need to give you a warning in a way that's not going to interrupt our class. And so this is just a quick and easy way to do it that and I explained that to them so if you explain that to them then they're like okay I, I get it um and so I would definitely though if you're going to use it in the upper grade just explain that to them you know this I'm not trying to be childish with you this is just a quick and easy way for me to give you a warning without stepping class and without making a big deal about it and and normally they understand that now what is a warning a warning is are you ready for this a warning that's it. And the beauty of this system is that you can set it up so that your students get one or two or three or however many warnings you want to give them before they get a consequence. So the way I set it up, and there's no right or wrong for how you set it up, but the way I did it was if a student was talking in my class, I wrote their name on the board. If they talked again, I put a little mark by it. And if they were talking a third time in the same 40 minute class period, then there was an actual consequence. Um, so the first two times, nothing happened. I did not tell their parents. I did not keep track of it. Nothing happened. It was simply a warning. And I explained to them, the goal of this, once again, is for me to just tell you that you're talking without interrupting class and constantly saying, stop talking. It's just a way for you to see and to be reminded and to get a warning and to just self-correct your own behavior. If you self-correct, nothing happens. You are not in trouble, nothing is wrong. If you ignore the warnings and keep going, that's when we're gonna have a problem. And so that's where you do need to have some type of consequence, whatever whatever you decide, however many warnings, however, whenever they repeat, it's up to you. Um, but there does need to be some type of consequence. And the consequence, I can't really tell you what it should be. It depends on your school. Some things are appropriate in some schools and not in others. So pick something that works with your school. Ask around to other teachers. Ask administration what's an appropriate consequence if you're not sure. And for schools, real quick, that say I'm not allowed to give consequences at all. OK, if you're in a school like that, that's tricky, but just flip, flip it a little bit. Instead of giving a consequence, take away a privilege, which is essentially the same thing, but it's worded differently. <laughs> so, um, you know, if everyone gets to have, you know, five minutes of free time at the end of class, those that get the warnings don't get the free time. Uh, something like that. If there's a party at the end of the week. Those that get, you know, get get this to this point, lose the privilege. So um, if you need to, you can reframe it as losing a privilege or not getting a reward as opposed to getting a consequence. So just tweak that as needed. Okay, I'm gonna take questions here in just a second. I know there's a bunch coming up, but let me just talk to you for a second why I recommend a system like this. Um, it works well if you're struggling, okay? Because for a few reasons, one, it promotes individual responsibility. How many of you, I've done this, has stood in front of the class and said, class, please stop talking. Please stop talking. Stop talking. Stop talking. Please stop talking, class. I mean, you feel like a broken record. and You feel like you're going to drive yourself nuts, much less your students, right? And the problem with that is that the students that are listening are, you know, you know, we're, they're, they're feeling bad because they keep getting yelled at, even if you're not yelling. And the students that are causing the problems aren't even really heeding anything. They're just, it's going right over their heads, right? So it's just not very effective. So a system like this promotes individual responsibility. They see their name, they know, okay, I got a warning. It's me. I, okay, I am the problem. I'm either going to correct it or, you know, something's going to happen here. And as I said, I love this because it curbs behavior without nagging and often without any consequences. I had 100 students every day for six. I had six different class periods of middle school math students. And I probably actually gave out the consequence five to 10 times a year, maybe. Now, you do have to be prepared to actually give it out a few times. Your students do need to see that you are serious and that something will happen. But I love this system because 
it, like I said, there, there was very few consequences ever got out. No, you know, nine times, 99 times out of 100, the students self-corrected and there was no need to go any further. And it just works. It really helped. I was in a pickle. I, my classroom, I had just students talking left and right. It was chaotic. It was crazy. But when they start seeing those names going up, it really, um, it gets their attention and it really can make a big, big difference. <laughs> All right, one more thought here, and then I'm going to pause and take a couple questions before we go into number three. Some of you might have been thinking, it might be in the back of your head, but I've heard that behavior charts and warning systems are a bad idea. I just read a blog post about so-and-so who's getting rid of her behavior chart, and it sounded, you know, she had all these reasons why, like, maybe I should do that. Here's the truth. Teaching is a journey. Some of you are really experts. You're expert classroom managers. You're here because you're always learning something new, but you, you're doing great. Some of you are struggling like I was at first, and you're like, I'm desperate. I am really struggling. The truth is that ditching the warning system is a great eventual goal. And you know what? By year four, by October, I wasn't using the warning system in at least four or five of my six classes. I was only using it in one or two classes that were really a handful. The rest, I wasn't even using it. I didn't need it anymore because I built my confidence, because I knew what to do, because all the intangibles were in place. But you have to have order in your classroom. And these other methods, the people that are writing blog posts about how they're ditching their warning system and how they're go, you know, they're doing this instead, they have a lot of skill and expertise born of experience and born of confidence. And it's great for them that they are able to do that. But don't feel bad if you're not there yet. Okay. Um, you if what you need most is order. And if this is going to help you get order, don't feel bad about it. All right? Your students will understand, especially if you frame it to them the way I told you to frame it to them. Say, you know, we're not, this is, we're all on the same team here. We're working together. Um, you, it's a great goal to say, eventually I won't need this anymore. You know, in five years down the road, I want to get rid of this. Great goal. But don't feel guilty for using in the meantime. Hope that makes sense. Okay. Um, let's make it personal. And then I'm going to take just a couple questions before we move on. So what system will you use starting tomorrow to get attention? And what system will you use to eliminate distractions? All right, we're going to answer a bunch of questions at the end, but I just wanted to answer a couple here. Okay, a um, couple of you are wondering if this works for high school. Like I said, I do believe um, you can use these methods for high school. You just got to be creative in how you, um, how you use them. As I said, you can give warnings in a creative way all the way up through high school, um, especially if you just t sit down and you explain to them. I don't know if I'd write names on the board in high school if on upperclassmen. I used it with lowerclassmen. I don't know if I do that with upperclassmen, but think of another creative way um, to give warnings. You could simply put post-it notes on kids' desks or something like that. And I've had people use call and response saying all the way up through 12th grade. Just like I said, make it something fun that they'd enjoy using. Whole brain teaching, um, can certain elements of that are very effective in high school, especially um, the elements or I didn't really get to talk about, but it's where you do mini class lessons. That can work all the way up through college. I don't know if I'd use the call and response sayings for raise your hand for permission to speak in high school. Um, I might try a warning system instead. All right. Uh, Megan Note says, I would like to try a less verbal warning system. I really like that. Um, I think, yeah, I, I really recommend the without stopping, uh, not saying anything when possible. Sometimes you have to, but when you don't have to. All right, let me see here. I'm going to answer one other question, then we're going to move on here. Um, let's see. Julie says, will students believe you are sincere about what your procedures are if you just give a warning? How many warnings should one give? Well, the key here is that the warnings, um, while they're just a warning, if the students aren't heeding the warnings, there are consequences. So like I said, in mine, um, a third warning in one class period um, had a consequence. I know other teachers, you know, it's, it's two warnings in a whole day. You know, so it's really up to you how strict or non-strict you want to be with that. I wanted there to be wiggle room because here's the thing. I didn't want to hesitate to give a warning. I, I I wanted to give a warning when a student was just saying one little thing to his neighbor at the wrong, you know, at the wrong time or being disruptive, you know, or blurting out. Like, I just wanted to be able to be more strict with the warnings without worrying that I'm giving out all these consequences. So that's why I made a little more leeway. But it's really up to you. 
Corey says, did we talk about limiting, eliminating distractions already? Yes, that was the warning system. And if you missed it, uh, hopefully if the technology cooperates, we'll have a replay available. All right, we can answer more questions at the end, but I wanna keep going right now. Step number three, so we've got the right demeanor. We have a plan in place for how we're gonna eliminate the distractions and get students' attention. Now, the next step is to shake up your problem areas. All right, here's the question I have for you. What situation, circumstance, or routine is causing the most problems in your classroom? It might be what we just talked about. It might be the chatter and the blurting, um, but it could be bathroom breaks. It could be the start of class procedure. It could be end of class procedure. It could be, um, you know, students going to the restroom in the middle of class. Whatever it is, what is causing the most problem right now when kids come in the room? Yes, in the cafeteria. You know, what, what is the problem? Go ahead and type it in. Transitions. Yes. Okay, great. So have that in your mind. You're typing in the box. You're having that situation in your mind for this. All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to create a classroom shakeup. So first, you need to identify the problem area, which is what you're doing right now. Second, you need to determine a better procedure for this situation. Okay, so in other words, what you're doing right now isn't working. So you need to think through, how do I want this to work? What would be the ideal situation? So let's use the example of students coming into the classroom, all right, either in the beginning of the day or if you're in secondary, you know, for the beginning of class. You might think, okay, what's happening right now? Right now, students are running, they're talking to their friends, they're like all disruptive and it takes me forever to start class. So you think, okay, what do I want to do differently? Well, I want students to come in the class walk. I want them to go directly to their desk. I want them to get out the stuff that they're supposed to be working on. I want them to get started on a bell work right away. So they're not allowed to go to other students' desks. They're going right to their desks. So you think through, what is my goal? What do I want it to look like? And if you don't know, talk to other teachers. Teachers. And if you don't have other teachers to talk to, we can um, join our Facebook group. We have a Facebook group of Christian teachers, and that's a great place to add to um, talk with others. We can link to that at the end here. So think, what would a better procedure be? Then here's where the magic happens. Find a way to shake it up. Now, here's the problem. We, it's the middle of the year, right? It's October, almost November. So if we come in tomorrow and say, okay, from now on, I want you to come into the classroom this way. A couple students are going to listen, but by and large, the habit is there and students are going to nod their head and then the next day they're going to do what they've always done, right? It's hard to, like, it's like turning a moving ship, right? It's, it's, it's a little bit difficult. So what we want to do is force a reset by finding a way to shake it up. And so what we're doing is we're going to show with actions instead of words that things are going to be different. We're trying to get their attention. Let me explain what I mean. There's a couple ways that you can shake something up with the goal. The goal is to create a stir to get their attention. So you might take something out of the room. I had a teacher who their problem area was when the students went and hung up their coats on this coat rack. There were all kinds of problems. They were being all disruptive and they were getting in fights and everything. So we said, why don't you take the coat rack out of the room so that when the students come in to hang up their coats, they're going to not know what they're going to notice that the coat rack's missing. It's going to cause a bit of an uproar. There's going to be a confusion. And even though this sounds counterproductive, that's the goal. You want there to be a little bit of a confusion because you want the students to come to you and say, wait, what's going on? and they're noticing that something's changing. That's the goal. Um, another thing you can do is don't let the students into the room. Now, if you're gonna do this, check with your administrator, make sure this is okay first, but you can shut the door and stand outside it. And you know, if you're having trouble with students coming into the room or if this works with almost anything, shut the door and the students are gonna come and say, why, why aren't we going in? What's going on? What, what's happening? You know, is, is, is another class still in there? No, no, I just wanted to talk to you. And when they're coming to you and asking, that's your chance to explain what's going on. Um, another idea is to skip a certain part of your routine. Let's say you've been having trouble with bathroom breaks. And, you know, you normally, if you're in elementary classroom, you normally come in from recess and you go straight to the bathroom and then to your room. What if in coming back from recess, you just go straight to the room? You totally skip the bathroom break. You're going to have, you know, about 15 students going, wait, what about Mrs. So-and-so? What about the bathroom break? We didn't go to the bathroom, right? And you've got their attention. 
That is the goal, is to get their attention. The goal is to use actions instead of just words to show the students that things will be different. You're trying to force a mini reset, uh, kind of like, you know, that magic of that first week of school where everything's new. You're trying to force a little bit of that to make a fresh start. So you find a way to shake it up. And then you execute the shakeup. So you go in. I, I, you could do this tomorrow, but you might want to take another day to really think this through and make sure that it's ready. Um, so you take that and you do your shakeup. And then after you execute your shakeup, you teach the new procedure. And I'm going to tell you how to do that in just a second. But let me make sure we're, we're clear on this. So you have the way you're shaking up. Let's say you're closing. In our example, you're going to close your door and stand outside of it. So your students come, what's, what's going on, Mrs. Mrs. Smith? Why, why are we outside the door? And you say, okay, I want to get your attention. We are outside the door because we haven't been going into the room correctly. And, and then we're going to go on from there. This is not a time to shame them. This is not a time to get upset. This is just a time to be very matter of fact and explain how things are going to be different. So when you teach procedures, either after your shakeup or whenever you teach any procedure, like call and response sayings, like um, like your warning system, anything. This is how you need to teach it. The first step is to explain. Now, we all, ex we all know this step, but sometimes we're not clear enough. So you can't just say to your students, okay, we're going to come into the classroom correctly from now on. What on earth does correctly mean? You need to be really specific. We haven't been, we've been having trouble coming into the room. From now on, when you enter your room, you're going to walk calmly without running. You're going to go directly to your seat, not to your friend's seat. You're going to get in, you're going to sit in your chair and clear off your desk. You're going to find your homework and put it on your desk. You're going to look up at the board and see what bell work is we, you are working on. And you're going to get started even before the bell rings. Does everyone have, anyone have any questions? All right. And so you're going to explain in detail what's going to happen. Next, you're going to practice this. So if you haven't been practicing your procedures, you've got to practice them. Kids, once again, they're in a bad habit. So you've got to help them get in a new habit. So you're going to practice it together. You're actually going to go through the routine. Okay, now we're going to come into the room. Ready? I'm going to open the door and you're going to walk in quietly. You're going to go straight to your desk, get out your homework, clear everything else off your desk and get started on the bell rock. Let's begin. And you actually do it together. A lot of teachers do that, but the real magic happens in steps three and four. Step three, you have to correct anything that goes wrong. So let's say that Isaiah runs into the room and Marie goes and talks to her other friend first and Jordan, um, you know, Jordan forgets to get out her homework. You need to correct that. You need, you need to say, you know, okay, you guys did great overall, but, you know, don't forget, you know, we don't run so-and-so, remember, and we don't go to our friend's seat, and, and, and you've got to correct all the little things, because otherwise they won't think you mean what you say. If, if they, you want them to follow the procedure, you have to correct it. Um, number one, because you need, they need to know that you're serious, but number two, once again, they're in a bad habit, so don't think that they're being you know, these horrible kids, if they do it wrong, they have to relearn how to do this, and so just be patient with them, but be very insistent. And finally, here's the magic. Have them redo the whatever they did wrong. So let's say that, like I said, um, you know, Isaiah comes running into the room. You say, Isaiah, remember, we need to walk into the room. Don't stop there. Because right now he's like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Say, Isaiah, I need you to go back outside and come back in, please. If you have them redo it, that's going to do a couple things. Number one, it shows them you're serious and that they need to listen to what you say. It kind of does it very kindly, but firmly, right? Number two, it helps it cement it in their mind, right? If you just say it, they might even think, okay, I need to do that. But I mean, it's just, it's just one in a million things that they heard that day. If they actually have to go back and redo it. It really helps them. You're going to feel weird asking them to redo it, but that is where the magic happens. That is where things are really going to change, especially mid-year when you're trying to create a reset. All right, so let's make it personal. How will you shake up your problem area? And we can maybe go through some more examples at the end. If you don't know right now, this can be a great thing to discuss in the comments or in our Facebook group or with a teacher at your school. Um, but just think creatively. Think, how could I shake this up? You know, someone says, my kids enter at different times. Um, that's, you know, then you 
you have an option there. You you can do the shake up with the door shut and just make everyone wait a long time, or you could think of a different way um, to shake it up. I'm not going to sit here and try to think of. If you ask at the end, maybe I can help you think of something. Um, but think about how can I shake up my classroom area and just be be um, be creative about it. Think of just something that will get their attention a little bit um, and and go from there. Corey says, I have several problem areas. How can I choose which is the most important? Um, okay, that's a tough question. So you have an option. You could tackle things one at a time. Or if I had, let's say, you know, a few things that I wanted to work on, I would do it all together. Like I would pick a day this week, maybe not tomorrow, because maybe you want to have all your ducks in a row. And I would say, okay, we're going to change like these two or three most important things on the same day. Like this is just going to be chaos day because we're going to be changing everything. Like I really want to get their attention. I'd shake them up at the same time. Um, if you have two or three areas, I'd shake up as many as uh, I'd shake them up at the same time. I wouldn't necessarily try to do like if you have 10 things that might be a little too much, um, but I'd try to, I, you can shake up a couple times, a couple things at the same time. Once again, the idea is you're trying to force a reset a little bit like the first day of school as much as you can. All right, I want to answer more questions, but let's get through um, the rest of these and then we'll take questions. Step number four, deal with problems while they are small. So this is after your reset, um, you want to deal with problems while they're small. This was totally my biggest mistake when I started teaching. I remember seeing students that were talking or putting their head down or leaning back in their chair or not taking notes or sleeping or whatever. And I just thought, you know, it's not that big of a deal. Like they're just talking. It's not that big of a problem. I just, I won't say anything. And honestly, I was scared to say, I was kind of scared to say something. It was kind of nutty, but that's how I felt. And I just figured it wasn't that big of a deal. I certainly didn't want to give it attention. They're just talking. And, and so I didn't deal with it. I just let it go. I said nothing. And the problem with that is we wish we could let our students just do these, you know, the little things um, that aren't, you know, that aren't within the framework of, we wish little things weren't a big deal. But the problem is that little problems don't stay little. I wish they would and we could just let them go. But that's not what happens, especially if you lack confidence and um, to to correct them. So little problems don't stay little. And that's why you have to deal with problems while they are small, before they get too big. And I know some of you right now, as I, I was my first year at this time of year, I was already like, it was already too late. Okay. My class was already a mess and I had a million problems to deal with. I couldn't deal with these little ones. And that's why I recommend doing a reset with the classroom shakeup. So the classroom shakeup should get their attention for at least a few minutes, right? And after you explain the procedure, those are like those magical few minutes, deal with every problem while it's small, while you have that reset. Now, what does deal with mean? This was my mistake that I had. Okay. I thought that in order to deal with the problem, I had to give a consequence. I had to give a detention or whatever it is at your school. And that's why I hesitated. But what I learned was that dealing with a problem can often be as simple as correcting it or the correct and redo, right? Sue, so, um, you walked into class wrong. Please go back and please do it again. Or Randy, uh, you need to sit up, please. Or walking to the board and putting the warning down. Just be consistent. Just deal with it. Just make an acknowledgement of it. Um, and just once again, you're having high expectations and you're holding your students through them. But just keep that in mind. It doesn't have to be a consequence every single time. Your students are learning this new procedure. You just shook everything up and they're a little bit discombobulated. So be patient with them, but be very insistent and deal with the problems while you're while they're still small. So let's make it personal. How will you deal with the first problem that arises after your shakeup? You have to know what you're going to say, all right? If you're struggling with classroom management, practice it tonight in front of a mirror. What am I going to say to the first student? You know, what am I going to do when the first student, you know, blurts out an answer after we just talked about this? Okay, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to say. What do I do to the first student that just walks out of the room? This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to say. If you know in your mind what you're going to do and say, you'll be confident and you'll hopefully actually do it. If you wait for the moment, you're you're gonna probably freeze, right? If you've been struggling with this, once you're an expert classroom manager, you don't have to plan everything out. You'll be able to think on your feet. But if you're struggling, don't wait and think on your feet. Plan it out ahead of time. 
All right, on to step number five. I'm gonna to try to finish these out and then we'll take all your questions, as many as we can. Finally, in order to have long-term success, you must develop relationships with your students. And you guys know that. We're gonna talk about just a couple techniques and a couple mindset shifts in this area. The first concept we wanna talk about is called the emotional bank account. So imagine that each student in your room has this bank account. Um, so to speak, and this box represents the bank account. You can make deposits into the bank account by showing them you care, by empathizing with their situations and their struggles, by showing interest in the things that they're interested in, right? All these things and, and many more. Every time that you do that, you make a deposit into their bank account, right? And so they have money as it were. They have, they have there's something in their bank account. Because here's what happens. Whenever you hold students to expectations, requiring them to redo things or you know, expecting them to, to do things that they're not used to, or when you have to discipline them, that is a withdrawal. And here's what happens. If you've invested enough into the bank account, when you have to make that withdrawal, it might not be pleasant, but it's okay. But if there's nothing in that bank account, if that bank account is empty, you're going to bounce that check. When you go to make that withdrawal by discipline, that's when you have the monstrous blowouts and that's when things just go horribly wrong. And so the point is to spend the time investing into their bank accounts, showing them that you care, showing interest in the things that they're interested in. And it will really help in the long run, long term. As you're doing this, invest more in the students who are most challenging. They're the ones you need to make the most withdrawals from. So you need to invest more into them than you even would your average student. Um, so take more time with them. Another thing that's important is to seek first to understand. Uh, you know, before we go into this, I, I thought I had this later, but let me share one more thing about challenging students. I don't know if you guys have heard of the two by 10 principle. Um, this was uh, my friend Angela Watson talks about this on her website, The Cornerstone for Teachers. And it's very simple. It just simply simply says, if you have a challenging student, take two minutes a day for 10 days. All right. So pick that whatever your most challenging student is, whether you teach, you know, have 100 students or 10 students, who's the most challenging? Say for the next 10 days, the next two weeks, I'm going to take two minutes a day to talk to them about anything, preferably not school related, to be honest, just anything at all. Just and the point is just to invest purposefully into that relationship. And teachers have reported amazing results with this simple strategy of just taking two minutes a day to talk with their most challenging students. So I, I encourage you to try that. All right. The next thing we're talking about is seeking first to understand, then to be understood. All right, now this, you do not have time to do this with every interaction, right? If someone's talking and you give them a warning, well, this is not, you know, this big in-depth thing. But there are times when you see, when you need to have a conversation one-on-one -on -one with the student because you see there's like a bigger issue here, right? It's either a, a repetitive issue or the student's really having a problem or it's a big issue, something like that. The goal is to seek first to understand what's happening in the student then to be understood. If we have a canned lecture that we give every time, you know, we have a student who's not turning in their homework, that's not going to be nearly as effective as if we stop and try to understand why isn't the student doing their homework? Do they not, are they busy? Do they, are they not understanding it? Is there not a good place in their home to do it? Do they, are they distracted by their peers? You know, there's a reason underneath there and just putting a blanket, they don't care. Why don't they care, right? So if you can seek first to understand why they're struggling with this, then you can, re you can, then when you go to be understood, you can craft your response to that, right? If the student is struggling because they've just kind of given up, they just, I'm not doing my work because I'm, I just, I just don't think I can do it then you address it in that way. If the students, you you discover that, you know, they have their whole study hall to work on it, but they'd rather talk with their friends, you talk to them about that, right? So you're tailoring your responses to the situation by, by talking to them first and trying to get to the bottom of why this is happening. Um, so for example, let's say you have a student that is just, you know, the, normally they're pretty engaged, but today they're just, they're really struggling. They are just not focused at all. And they're, you know, causing problems. And let's say you're stopping and you want to talk to them about it. Asking them why can be huge. You might discover something's going on at home, or you might realize um, that there's, 
maybe they're just, you know, in, in a bad mood. And you can talk to them about how, you know, we do have moods and that happens, but this is how we handle them, right? So discovering why they feel that way can really help guide your conversation. It can be the difference between this conversation and this conversation, right? So make it a goal to ask your students, you know, to talk with them and to look for those underlying reasons um, before you launch into the lecture um, so that you can tailor your responses. So let's make it personal. What can you do tomorrow to build stronger relationships with your students? Love to hear um, a little bit about what you're thinking um, of what you can do tomorrow to strengthen your relationships. And one thought as you're writing those down is that this it we need to be intentional about this. I know I mean, you're here trying to learn about how to be better with your classroom management. You care about your students, right? And they can sense that. But we also have to be intentional about it. The more intentional we can be, the more we can plan this, um, the more successful we are at investing in that. I'm so excited to see a lot of you guys are going to try the 2 by 10 That'll be awesome. All right. So we're going to do the Q&A here in just a minute. Um, let's recap, though. Um, in order to be successful, our five-step plan, first, we're going to find the right demeanor. We're going to develop systems to get and keep attention. We're going to shake up our problem areas. We're going to deal with problems while they're small, and we're going to build strong relationships. If you do this, you are going to see improvements. However, the problem is that Great classroom management is nuanced. Remember I told you in the beginning that I had a lot of things checked off my classroom management. You know, I had a lot of things I was doing right, but I missed a few key elements and those few things really left me in a disaster. One missing element truly can throw off all your best efforts and put you in a sticky situation. And that's why I've developed Classroom Management 101. It's an online course, and it's a complete organized system that ensures you don't miss any of the crucial elements of classroom management. Classroom Management 101 guides you step by step through the process of how to develop and then implement a strong classroom management plan. I shared with you as much as I could in this one hour training, but there's just so much that we didn't get to. We talked a little bit about developing the right mindset, but there's so many more things like how to take responsibility or what to do when you are lacking support. Module two is all about how to prepare your plan. We go into the specifics of how exactly you put together a strong classroom management plan, how you have the right um, expectations, how you have the right consequences and rewards and all of those things. Module three, we talk about how to prevent problems. We didn't even get to hardly go over that at all today. So we have a whole module about how to prevent problems from happening in the first place. Module four, we get super specific on how to address problems that arise. So how do you have this conversation with a student? How do you have a conversation with a parent? How do you deal with specific problems like class clowns or defiant students or back talkers? Module five is about inspiring or motivating your students to learn. And we talk about nine specific ways that you can do that. And module six is fun. We talk about how to troubleshoot challenging situations like what if you get a new student mid-year, how to manage transitions, what to do with cell phones, and all kinds of other fun situations like that. So how exactly does this work? There are video lessons that guide you through each strategy, and they're organized so that you can take them step by step. Each video is only about five to 10 minutes long, um, so it's pretty easy to jump on and just do one at a time or to do a bunch at once. You can watch them at your own pace, so there's no required schedule. You can take it totally at your own pace and do on your whenever works for you. And you get a printable manual with the notes already taken for you. I know you're busy, and so I wanted to make this as easy for you as possible. Um, so the notes are already taken for you. You can add to them if you want. Um, but that means you can listen. You can listen to the videos while driving, while um, cooking, cleaning, anything, without having to be forced to sit down in front of a computer and take notes. So you might be wondering, who is this for? It's for anyone in grades K through 12. Um, it's especially helpful for new teachers or for anyone that's struggling with classroom control. 
It's also great if you're feeling like I got a lot of elements together, but I think I might be missing a few things. And that's like, like I was, and it can be very helpful um, for that as well. There's some awesome bonuses I want to share with you real quick. You get the self-evaluating activity, which helps you identify your problem areas. Um, you also get the easy reminder system for when you're finished with the course, this will help you remember and apply what you've learned. You also get the bonus back to school module. This is great come next year. You can revisit the back to school module before the school year starts and it will help you to take full advantage of that awesome first week of school. If you join tonight, there's a couple extra bonuses. You'll get a free copy of my Create Your Dream Classroom ebook. You'll also get the classroom procedures, uh, 50 procedures that will save your sanity free training. So you'll also um, get that as well. And I'll choose one person from those that sign up tonight to get a free half hour coaching session with me. So I'll pick one person of the people that sign up tonight. And if you are ready to sign up or check it out, you can click that offer right there that says um, find out more and that will take you right there. Or you can go to teachfortheheart.com slash CM101 for Classroom Management 101. You might be wondering, uh, what is the price? Well, typically it's $147 for an individual or $697 for a school license, but I really wanted to make it affordable. And so um, from now through next Thursday, you can pay the price that you can afford. So what that means is that you can go and I've created coupon codes for you and you can choose the amount that you can afford and pay that instead of the regular $147 price. And I even have payment plans if you want to break it up into a couple payments. So all you got to do is you head over there and these codes are on the page. So you don't have to worry about writing them down or anything. But you pick the amount that you can afford and use that coupon code to pay the amount that you can afford. I'm about to get to the Q&A, but wanted to cover just a couple more things. I want you to know there is a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you're if you're interested, but you're just not completely sure, um, you can definitely check it out. And if for any reason it's not what you thought, I'll be happy to refund your money. Just make sure you tell me within 30 days, because after that, my system won't let me refund it. So just let me know within 30 days, and it's no problem at all. When you're ready to enroll, just click through and make sure you hit the redeem coupon button and type in your coupon and you'll actually see it come off and you'll see the new price. And that's how you'll know you're in just the right spot. All right, I'm gonna take questions right now. Um, I'll put the codes up again. Yes, they're also on the page. So if you click the button that says find out more or if you go to teachfortheheart.com slash CM101, these codes are also there, but I'll put them up here for a moment so you can have them as well. All right, I'm looking forward to seeing so many of you guys in Classroom Management 101. I'm gonna answer some questions now. We got a few minutes left. All right, can you show the codes again? Yes, they're up here right now. Um, did we talk about blurters, Susan asks. Um, we didn't talk specifically about blurters, but when I talked about eliminating distractions, I would use the same things for blurters. So I would have some type of system, either the, either the whole brain teaching or the warning system, and I would use that for blurters too. Um, welcome, Joanna, to Classroom Management 101. So glad to have you. All right, let's see here. Some other questions that you have. Um, Christian, uh, the Facebook group. I will find the link for you real quick here. Um, and I will put the link here in just one second. Okay, yep. All right, I will put the link to the Facebook group in the chat here momentarily. Okay. All right, let's see what other questions we have. What are some ideas to diminish students blurting out and talking? Um, I highly recommend, um, I would recommend the warning system with that, as well as the, um, or the whole brain teaching. That's what I'd recommend for those that are having trouble with um, blurting and talking out. Let's see what other questions we can answer for you. If you have questions, now's the time to ask them. What if the main issue is just with one student, Mary asks. Um, first of all, I try that two by 10 strategy. Absolutely, I would try that. And um, then I would also recommend um, 
I would talk with your administrator and get some advice from them. And I'd also be, depending on the age of your student, I'd be investing, I'd be looking for that underlying reason. Why are there problems? There's an underlying reason there. And if you're just dealing with the surface behavior, you're not getting at that underlying reason. So I'd really try to pay a close attention and see if you can figure out what that underlying reason is. Um, someone asked, can I install fake ca cameras in my classroom? Um, I don't know. You, I, that would depend on if your principal is allowed, allowing that. So I would ask your principal um, and get permission from them um, before doing that. But yeah, ask your principal and see if, that would, if that's allowed. Uh, welcome to Elizabeth and Maria. So glad to have you in Classroom Management 101. It's awesome. If anyone is having trouble with the enrollment process, please, process, please let me know. I'd be happy to help you with that. Okay, um, next question. How do I deal with boys who won't stay in their seats? Um, I'm not sure what age you have here. Um, if it's, you know, old enough, if it's in an old enough amount where they are physically able to sit in their seats, I definitely, um, you can use a warning system with that. That, that could definitely work. Um, sometimes too, if it's a problem with just antsiness, there's a lot of teachers have found success finding ways for them to get out their antsiness within their seats, you know, putting, they've had, you know, something to bounce their foot on or something to fidget with um, can be helpful. But the, but if they're old enough and, and they're, that's not the problem, if they just want to get up and wander around, then I would have, I would use the warning system and some type of consequence for that. And, um, you know, give them a little time to adjust. But I mean, that's a matter of you being insistent for the most part. Um, Carolyn says, I purchased Classroom Management 101, but cannot remember my password. Um, if you go to login, there should be a button to reset it. Um, but if you can't figure it out, send us an email to lynda at teachfortheheart.com, and we can help with that. How do, Corey says, how do I get to the page where I can put in the coupon code? If you're trying to enroll, um, you need to go ahead and you scroll down to the bottom and choose. Um, you can choose whether you want to make one payment or two separate payments. And then on the next screen is where you'll be able to enter your code. So um, head over there. Um, let us know if you run into any trouble with that. All right. Let's see what's next. How long is the coupon code good for? These coupon codes will be good through next Thursday. So next Thursday um, is when they will be good through. Let's see. Oh, good. Glad you found it, Corey. Angie says, my class isn't team players. Third grade, and they bicker and argue all the time. I feel like I'm constantly giving negative dojo points with no results. Okay. Um, we do talk some about drama in Classroom Management 101. Um, I'm trying to think if I have anything specific to share with you here. I That might be time to really sit them down and have a talk with them, to be honest. And sounds like it's tough when you have a negative classroom culture because you can't just demand that. It has to be a little bit of a change of heart and for them to realize that this is not acceptable. I would, you might want to look into morning meetings. Um, just Google morning meetings. Um, that's something that a lot of teachers have found helpful and that might be really helpful for you in trying to develop that culture um, within your class. Uh, Susan says, can you say your email again? It's lynda at teachfortheheart.com. Linda at teachfortheheart.com, anyone that's having any trouble um, with anything. Uh, welcome to Elizabeth. So glad to have you. And Dallas and Megan and Corey. Uh, so glad to have you in Classroom Management 101. Let's see what other questions I can answer. How do I build a relationship with a student that is challenging? I'm just going, um, I would definitely try that two by 10. Commit to just talking to them. Um, on your own time. Um, so I uh, commit to talking with them and to just developing that relationship in that way. But I will just share with you a piece of encouragement. I had a student in sixth grade who was the most challenging student I ever had, which I won't go into the details of the issues that we had, but she just did not like me. Flat out did not like me and made no bones showing it to me. And it was very frustrating. And I remember I had her, I, we, I taught in a small Christian school, so I had the same kids in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. So it was the first day of seventh grade. I remember coming, being like, okay, fresh start. Let's like start off the year right. And I went up to her and said, hi, you know, how did your summer go? And she just turned around and walked away. And I was like, this is going to be a long year. But I continued to pray for her, which I would highly recommend praying for them as well. And I continued to just do my best to just continue to be kind and reach out. 
And I don't know, really God did a work in her heart. I can't take credit for anything, but she slowly turned around over the course of that year. And by the time I had her as an eighth grader, she was one of my favorite students. She came in and talked to me almost every day just for the fun of it. And she even got to the point where she told me, I can't believe what an idiot I was in sixth grade. Like, I can't believe I did that and I treated you that way. And it, I, she was such a blessing to me. She was honestly one of my biggest blessings as a teacher. And I remember um, I got Christmas cards from her even after I wasn't teaching at that school anymore. She sent me a graduation announcement in the mail four years later. It just... Um, I still think of her as one of my biggest blessings. So just a piece of encouragement, don't give up. That took over a year to see that turnaround. So you might not even see it during this school year, but don't give up, keep working, and um, just keep investing in them. Okay, Kiera last um, asks, how long does Classroom Management 101, the offer last? So the offer is good through next Thursday. So I know a lot of you are about to get paid and I want to um, allow for that if you need to wait until payday. So you can, uh, those codes will be good through next Thursday. How do you deal with students who refuse to do anything and don't respond to consequences. Okay, this is a tricky situation. If students are refusing to respond to consequences, um, I would get your administrator involved um, because it, there just needs to be something else there. If you're giving consequences and nothing's happening, I would talk to your administrator, see if they can get involved. Sometimes the consequences need to be escalated. I would also, as I said, invest in that student. Try to get to the why. Why is there a problem here? Like, what is underlying the issue? Obviously, there's a surface issue, but there's something underneath it. And try to get at that as well. And also, you know, think about consequences. Um, sometimes if a consequence isn't something a student cares about, um, maybe get creative in your consequences. I know with high school, something super effective can be three minutes of free time at the end of class you know, can be an incredible incentive. So maybe get creative and, and try something else. If what you're doing isn't working, try something else. I uh, wanna welcome Sheila and Allison and Tanisha and Lori. Welcome to Classroom Management 101. We're so excited to have you. All right, it's officially been one hour. So officially um, the classroom, um, the training ends here, but I'm gonna stay on and answer some questions for you guys. So I will stay on a little longer. Wanna let you know if you'd like your certificate of attendance, you can get it at teachfortheheart.com slash certificate. So head to teachfortheheart.com slash certificate. Okay, if you still have a question that you didn't answer, um, definitely let me know. Once again, here's the certificate for those of you that are looking for that. Wanda says, I won't get paid until Friday. Will the coupons still be available? Yes, they'll be good through next Thursday. So I wanted to allow um, for a payday, whether you get paid at the end of the month or on Friday, they'll be good through the following Thursday. So November the 9th, I would just recommend putting a note on your calendar so you don't forget about it. Corey, advice on pencil problems. Um, <laughs> If you're talking about students not bringing pencils to class, the most genius solution I found, I actually talk about in the bonus to Classroom Management 101, those 50 procedures that will save your sanity. Um, but the what I recommend most for that um, is getting a packet of golf pencils. You can get them on Amazon for like just a few bucks, uh, less than $10. You can get 100 golf pencils. And those are those little tiny pencils with no eraser and they're like half size. And that way, if a student needs a pencil, you have something to give them, but they don't like it. So it motivates them to get their own pencil as opposed to just always depending on you. So that's the most ingenious answer I've ever come across. Okay, a couple more questions here. I'm a new teacher. I teach Title I. I'm the youngest teacher in the high school. And my biggest problem is getting kids to understand that I'm not a kid. It's been hard when everyone treats me like a child. What can I do to change this? Okay, um, yes, I got, I got those of us that get our first job first right out of college. Um, this can be a challenge, especially in teaching high school. Um, so the biggest thing you can do is you need to focus on being as professional as you can. I would dress very professionally. I would dress more professionally than any other teacher in your school because you're having a problem with this. You want them to see you differently. So, I mean, I would dress professionally, blazers, um, suits, you know, that type of thing. Um, and I would recommend also really checking your demeanor make sure you're not being you know 
friend-ish with them, that you're acting like a mentor. And just put these elements of classroom management in place, hold them to high expectations, and they will start, you will start to gain their respect. So um, commit to acting like the teacher, and in time, they'll start to see you like that. So I hope that's helpful. Um, Tyler says, what is the best way to get students to raise their hand without talking? Do you hand out multiple um, warnings? Um, so if you're having a problem with blurting, um, I would do a classroom shakeup. And then I would explain, you know, we've been, I've been letting you, I would even apologize. I'm sorry, I've been letting you, you know, get away with raising your hand, with talking out loud when you raise your hand. But the problem is that that's really disruptive to everyone else. And so from now on, this is what you need to do. And if you don't, this is what's going to happen. And I would, I would do a simple warning. I would do that with a warning system. That's what I would recommend. Alexandra asks, can we rewatch this video? Um, Yes, um, I will hopefully, assuming everything works correctly, I will hopefully send out a um, a link tomorrow where you'll be able to rewatch the video. Uh, welcome those of you that are joining, Harriet and Alicia. So glad to have you. And someone else that I can't see your name. Welcome as well. Okay, let me see if there's any other final questions here. How do I deal with students that talk to others at the wrong time and then complain about people talking around them? Okay. <laughs> oh, we can all relate to this, can't we? Um, when you have students that are talking to others at the wrong time, um, I would deal with that. Once again, I would strongly recommend some type of either warning system or whole brain teaching. Have a system for dealing with students that are talking at the wrong time. Okay. And if they're complaining about other students, I mean, you just got to tell them, you know, hey, we got to worry about worry about other students. But if they see you consistently correcting problems, um, that's going to start getting rid of that complaining. So you're going to get some pushback at first, um, but I would just encourage them to focus on themselves. And, um, you know, in time, if you're consistent, that will help cut down on those complaints. All right, Susan says, I think I registered and paid last spring. How can I check on this? You can go ahead and go through and hit the login button in the upper right hand corner and try logging in and see if that will work. Uh, you can also send us an email to Linda at teachfortheheart.com and we'd be happy to check into that for you. Um, can you get the certificate tomorrow? Yes, teachfortheheart.com slash certificate. It will be available there for sure. Um, Shelly, unfortunately, I don't have a transcript because I don't have someone sitting here, you know, re recording it as I go, but you, this will be available for replay um, tomorrow, hopefully. All right, guys, thank you so much. Once again, if you want all those special, um, the just to be clear on the Classroom Management 101, the price is good through next Thursday. If you want those special bonuses, the book, uh, the Create Your Dream Classroom book to be entered into the drawing for the giveaway and also to receive the bonus classroom procedures that will save your sanity, um, make sure that you sign up tonight. Um, I will give you guys another hour or so to do that. So if you, you know, I know if you're still reading through everything, getting everything together, that's no problem. Um, you can go ahead and sign up through the rest of the evening and I'll hopefully send those out sometime tomorrow. If you can't join tonight, as I said, the um, the special bonuses go away, but you still get the regular bonuses and then you can use the pay what you can afford promotion through next Thursday. All right, I've got any final questions. I'm going to answer the final questions and we're going to call it a night. Welcome, Laura, to Classroom Management 101. So glad to have you. All right. Okay, one last question here. Julie says, I have an understanding of students who are going through a lot of hard things in their life. My problem is while I may at times get distracted by things, but I, stri I strive to want to calm the room down because of those who were really in there to want to learn and do good. So how do I find the balance? I feel bad when I laugh at a class clown, but the few look annoyed because they just want instruction. Um, it is a balance there. I, th I think what you're trying to say here is that um, you know, you've got, you know, students, you've got students that are going through tough times, and but you've got students that want to learn. Here's the thing, even with the students, the fact that students are going through a tough time and are struggling, um, shouldn't, that should produce empathy and understanding, but that shouldn't produce excuses for them. Does that make sense? So, um, 
the fact that you've got students in your class that are going through tough times should make you want to pull for them, should make you want to support and help them, should provide context and understanding in how you deal with them. But if you say, man, they're going through a tough time at home, like I'm basically like going to let them kind of in my mind, I'm just kind of not really going to expect anything of them in my class. You're doing them a disservice. Um, so you you got to change the way you think. I'm not sure if that's what you're saying. I'm just sharing in general about that. Um, as far as laughing at a class clown, I mean, that depends on the situation. Sometimes humor is the best thing for a classroom. But yes, you definitely, I, I would, you want to create a classroom where everyone can learn, the students that want to and the students that don't. So you want to push everyone to learn and grow together. So hope that gives you a little bit um, to think about there. All right, you guys, thank you so much. It's been so great um, to be with you um, here. Um, got one last question. Trisha says, what do you do when everything you've said in the webinar and everything you know how to do with management just isn't working? Um, Trisha, in that situation, I would first of all talk to my administrator about it. I would also make it a big matter of prayer. God, sometimes when you've done everything that you know how to do, um, God knows what you need to do and he can give you wisdom and impress upon your heart what you need to do. So honestly, don't wait until you're desperate to pray, but especially when you just don't know what to do, take it to him. I'd also talk to your administrator and I'd also talk to any other teachers at your school that are making it work and ask them what they're doing. So that's what I'd recommend. I right, thank you guys so much. I'll continue to be here answering any questions, especially if anyone's having trouble uh, getting into classroom management 101. It's been so um, so good to be with you tonight. Um, let me just um, close in prayer and then I will will be done for the night. Thank you, Lord, so much for these teachers. I just pray that this has been helpful. I pray that you'll give them wisdom and guidance as they go to implement what they've learned. And just please continue to guide and direct and just bless in this evening and in this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, guys. It's been a pleasure.